Welcome to our program on political cartooning. I'm Catherine Algor and I'm the president of the Massachusetts Historical Society. I was reflecting on what I like about the Historical Society is on one hand, we are very old. We were founded in 1791, first historical society in America, and we began collecting uh, immediately. And we have 14 million items, pieces of America's past. But we're also very modern. And I would encourage you to visit our website. It's chock full of things. Um, you can uh, get to know some of our collections. We've got great features uh, like our blog, especially I would say an object of the month. And this month, as part of my uh, pitch for modernity, we are having our very first virtual exhibition. And it's called Who Counts? And it's about uh, a history of voter rights through political cartoons. So like tonight's panel, it couldn't be more timely. Um, and I wouldn't be doing my job as president if I didn't say while you were perusing the website, you clicked on that little support tab there and found a way to maybe give us a gift or better yet, become a member of the family by joining. So let's get started with our program tonight. And I'm going to toss it off to my colleague, Gavin Cleespees. Gavin. Thank you, Catherine, for that welcome. Uh, my name is Gavin Cleespees. I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm pleased to welcome all of you to our virtual program. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to extend a special, special welcome to anyone who might be attending a virtual program for the first time. Uh, in these days of social distancing, we have taken to hosting virtual events, and we have online events planned for the rest of the calendar year. I bring many subjects of U.S. history and Massachusetts history. Check out all of our events on our calendar, including our seminars, brown bag lunch talks, and our upcoming conference. We make our collections and our online programming available for free, but are only able to do this thanks to the support of our members and donors. So just to reiterate what Catherine said, uh, if you enjoyed the program this evening, I hope you'll consider becoming a supporter of MHS. So uh, Catherine also mentioned our... Um, current uh, exhibition. And I just wanted to uh, point out that uh, we have a new exhibition up, uh, which just started recently called Who Counts? A look at voter rights through political cartoons. Uh, and this program is the first of three programs which will help sort of supplement that uh, by looking at political cartoons uh, and the history of of cartooning. The program also, or the exhibition also has a supplementary page on the history of Thomas Nast, which among other things features uh, an illustration by Paul Zepp, which if you look closely during the program, you may see in his background. Uh, tonight we have a really great program. Uh, we'll hear from one of Boston's best known political cartoonists, Paul Zepp. He was the chief editorial cartoonist at the Boston Globe from 1967 through 2001. Uh, he's won two Pulitzer Prizes for his work, as well as the Thomas Nast Prize. Uh, he will be interviewed by New York Times bestselling author, William Morton. Uh, the conversation will go on for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for some questions and answers from the program. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over uh, to Bill Martin to, to take it from here. Thanks. Thank you, Gavin, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Bill Martin and uh, I write novels and I have uh, for a long time been a friend of Paul Zepp who is our guest here this evening. Paul Zepp who's won two Pulitzers, uh, the Thomas Nast Prize, the Distinguished Service Award for Editorial Cartooning, the National Cartoonist Society Editorial cartoonist of the year, and from 1967 to 2001, he was the uh, chief editorial cartoonist of the Boston Globe. I first met Paul when I was in high school. Uh, <laughs> Paul uh, came to be the guest speaker at uh, one of those award ceremonies that the Boston Globe used to do for young high school journalists. And I was the editor of my high school newspaper at Catholic Memorial in West Roxbury. And uh, so we all got to have a luncheon and here came this famous editorial cartoonist. Although it could only have been 1968, so you'd only been around for a year, Paul. But anyway, <laughs> he got up, 
He drew pictures for us. He showed us his thought process. He showed us his artistic process. Uh, by the way, he had a goatee back then, just so you, uh, just so you know. Uh, and the truth is, he was only probably in his mid-20s. Uh, but I was very impressed by Paul Zepp then. And uh, I'm hoping that tonight he'll talk a little bit more about his artistic process and impress all of you with some of the things that, uh, that, that I remembered from that conversation. Uh, when I moved to California with my wife in January of 1974, I got homesick. And I said to uh, my mother, I want you to mail me two things every week. I want you to mail me all of George Frazier's columns from the Boston Globe. And some of you may remember George Frazier, the columnist. And I want you to send me all of Zepp's cartoons. <laughs> this is true because Paul Zepp, uh, I felt at that time and still do, uh, was and is the greatest political cartoonist of his generation. Uh, and from 1967 uh, right up until today, Paul has been capturing the political life of this nation. And that is rather unique because for starters, Paul is a Canadian. And I want Paul to give us a little bit of a description of how he got started in Canada, and how he found his way at the Boston Globe. I did grow up in Canada. Actually, um, I'm, I'm a failed hockey player. That was my first dream was to play in the National Hockey League. And I did play minor league hockey, but at that time, the, there were only six teams in the National League, and I was owned by the Detroit Red Wings. And I knew I wasn't going to make the parent club. So it seemed that I was better suited to be a cartoonist in terms of uh, getting full-time employment. As it, as it turned out, I, I became the sports cartoonist for the Hamilton Spectator, the local newspaper, when I was 16, uh, which was quite, a, quite an exciting thing for a 16-year-old to be working for the local newspaper. Mm -hmm. And it, at some point, one of the sports writers said, you know, sports cartoons are really on the way out because of television. I mean, the great cartoonist in the United States was a guy named Willard Mullen. Um, and newspapers were just not running the sports cartoons anymore. He said, you should really look into political cartoons. I was not political. My parents were not political. They, my father had a garage. Um, they were wonderful parents, and they were very supportive of my artwork. But um, I started, I focused myself on in the area of political cartoons. And as a result of doing the, uh, being the sports cartoonist for the spectator, I was able to get into the National Art School in Toronto, the o Ontario College of Art, which at that time was really the only game in Canada. And they had kids from all over who were products of a high school art program, which I never had at, at a Catholic boys' school. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very lucky to get into this school, and uh, I, I became an illustrator which was, um, and my first job was really with the Financial Post in Toronto as a illustrator, designer, and cartoonist. The cartoons were, as you can imagine, the Financial Post was like the Wall Street Journal. They weren't terribly provocative, but they looked like editorial cartoons. And... I came across a, a fellow named Bill Sanders, who was the cartoonist for the Kansas City Star, and he was president of the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists. I sent Bill my portfolio, thinking that he, he might have some leads. I had no idea that there were only really 100 
maybe 150 jobs, but probably about 20 that are really good jobs with, you know, with big newspapers. Yeah. Um, anyway, he, his uncle was a guy named Gene Graham who used to come to the Globe in the summer to coordinate their intern program. And the Globe had never had a cartoonist. They had gone, they, had, they were very middle of the road. But then uh, Tom Winship took over from his father. And fortunately, Tom came from the Washington Post and was familiar with the workings uh, of the great herb block. Yeah. And that really was fortuitous for me because that's how he saw the job being designed, the way Herb did it. Yeah. And I was also fortunate because the Taylor family were wonderful. I mean, they, um, so, you know, right from the get go, I had, uh, I had freedom. I had, uh, support. Uh, it was around the, the globe was one of the first papers to come out against the war in Vietnam. I used to get a lot of toilet paper in the mail. Um, they were, I mean, they were very progressive. Um, right. They, they were a great newspaper in the seventies there. So you and, just, you made a very quick transition from, uh, uh, from Canada here to here to the globe without any stops in, in any United States papers on the way. Uh, I, I really was so fortunate. I mean, yeah. I went right to the one of the top papers in the country, and I yeah, you know, um, you got one of the you you were struck by lightning. I really was. It was I, you know, and, and I I was struck by lightning. I, you know, I also had the benefit of two great supportive parents. Yeah. Um, so you know, it was like almost what I was supposed to do. Something's, something's gone wrong. <laughs> I don't know what that was, but you're back. I can see you, Paul. Can you see me? I cannot see you, no. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, at least I'm able to see you. So I, I we will continue the conversation here and uh, continue to talk. Very bad, Bill. <laughs> huh? What? <laughs> I can't forget that beautiful face of yours. So it's okay. It, uh, uh, it's unforgettable. Famous to some, <laughs> infamous to others, and unknown to most. Uh, but but you had a, a a a great start. Now now you you never had to deal with your father, perhaps uh, saying you're going into cartooning, uh, you're going into illustrating, mostly because it sounds like the path was at the beginning pretty smooth for you. Would you say that? It, it really was. And, and yeah. my parents were both really supportive. I mean, my father came from Hungary when he was nine years old. Wow. He, 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 was a, he had a garage. Um, mm -hmm. He could do anything around the house, and he didn't want me to follow in that footstep. So yeah. Um, he was very encouraging, and but they both were. They were wonderful parents, and you know that makes a difference. So you arrive at the Boston Globe in 1967. Uh, you are at that point 20. How old were you then? You were about 24, 25. 24, 25. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, most people would say what kind of political wisdom can a 24 or 25 year old be bringing? And yet you were part of the, uh, the anti-war generation. And um, very quickly, you started doing cartoons about Lyndon Johnson, if I remember. Uh, yes, Lyndon Johnson was, was my, uh, was definite fodder at that time. Yep. The interesting thing was in my first marriage, my, my then wife's father was a general in the Canadian Air Force. Mm -hmm. And he had kind of pitched everybody on, on he was he was very pro Vietnam. Yeah. But it really didn't it, almost immediately upon moving to the United States, I, I saw an entirely different picture. And so it was very easy to, and as I say, the Globe was one of the first papers to come out against the war. So yeah. uh, I had the benefit of a lot of very learned people. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, you know, it's just a case of sponging it up. Right. Well, so you, you were absorbing all of this information, plus you had the artistic, um, the artistic skills that I think make your cartoons unique. And, and those are the, the detailing, uh, the, um, uh, sometimes the depth of field that you put a lot of creative technical work into whatever it is that you are drawing. Uh, in addition to the, to the, 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 the thematic work coming up with that good one liner, you know, you and I have known each other for a long time. You read my novels. I love your cartoons. And, uh, there are, we're both, we're both basically storytellers and yet there can be no more divergent, uh, um, media perhaps than the 600 page historical novel and the, uh, the single panel, uh, cartoon that's, that's got to tell so much in a single, um, in a single glance. Uh, so, and you do spell mo so much better than me too, Bill. <laughs> yes, yeah, but you, but you draw better than I do. I can guarantee you that. So, so you you get started with Lyndon Johnson, um, nineteen sixty seven, sixty eight, but in sixty eight, along comes Richard Nixon, and Nixon, uh, because he is he and his the people around him become a true target rich environment for Paul Zepp. And uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, uh, let's say the first cartoon you ever did of Richard Nixon. Ooh, I'm not sure I can remember it. I can't remember the first one, yeah. uh, but he, he was easy. I mean, he was, it was like stealing. I mean, he had all the, all the characteristics, you know, I could, Nixon was one of those guys you can draw from behind and you know, it's Richard Nixon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he was he, uh, up until today. Uh, he was the embodiment of everything evil that I had ever yeah. seen. Yeah. Um, now he doesn't, you know, he's, he's a piker next to this guy, but. We're seeing some Nixon on the screen at the moment as you talk. And, um, mm -hmm. Of course, the, the nose is the easy, the easy uh, um, characteristic. But when you look to draw a political figure like Nixon, and we're looking at the image, if you can't see it, we're looking at the image of, of David Frost uh, and Richard Nixon, um, which I guess you did when David Frost uh, died. Um, no, I did that when he actually interviewed him. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but when we look at this, this image or the other images of Nixon that we, that we have here, um, the question I always have is what comes first, the, uh, the idea or the composition? Um, well, I found through, uh, painful, painful meetings that you had to have the, the idea, the concept. Mm -hmm. uh, there were times when I had first started that job that I'd have a beautiful picture and no caption, uh, no concept, really. You, you have to know what, the, what, what, first of all, what you want to say. What is, what is the point you're trying to make? And then you try to think of it visually. Um, and then it just kind of falls into place. Uh, so, yeah. a lot, you know, the best ones are ones that really don't have a caption. Yeah, here we're looking at one of those just as you speak. It's of, of Nixon uh, with the three dogs of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos around him. And he's reading yeah. the book, The Nixon Doctrine. Yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, to me, that's that's the best kind of cartoon, editorial cartoon because it's it's strong visually. It's it, You like to think it's well drawn and... Um, yeah. You don't have to have a caption on who this person is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I I was lucky that I could always do caricature. My when I when I first started doing these sports cartoons back in Hamilton, that's what I did. I did 
caricatures of the Hamilton Tiger Cats and the, you know, the Toronto Maple Leafs and sports figures. Yeah. Doing caricature just always seemed to be a something I could do. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, again, <clears throat> it's a it's more of a British style, really, than it was an American style. I don't think yeah. even, even Herblock, as good as he was, was, you know, he wasn't a great caricaturist. He, but you knew who they were. Well, right. When you look at the Herb Block cartoon, it, it doesn't have anywhere near the kind of um, depth or, of detail that this image of Nixon with the Nixon Doctrine book in his hand has, uh, particularly around the face and jowls. Um, what Herb Block did, and which I, I don't always see you doing, you, you, Herb Block gave Nixon that five o'clock shadow and uh, he never shaved him, I guess, until he became president. And then Herb Block gave him a clean shaven face. Yeah, but, I remember. Yeah, yeah. But when you do a cartoon, um, it doesn't seem to me as if you go for the easy, um, the easy aspect of any, uh, any part of the caricature. Um, what you look for is just that, that salient characteristic, but you make it, you make it more human, I think, which is one of the things that, uh, that makes the, the images stay in our heads. Well, I, I just think there's comment in the caricature too. You, you know, you can, you're augmenting a, an image uh, almost to a, an, adding another layer to it by, by the kind, by the caricature itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're looking here at another figure from the '70s, uh, Tip O'Neill. Um, <laughs> yeah. You you have him looking a little bit like W. C. Fields here with a very big hat and uh, his fingers in his vest and a big cigar. Uh, you knew Tip O'Neill pretty well, didn't you? I did. I played golf with Tip. Um, what? I loved Tip. I mean, Tip was a... Tip was... I loved Tip. Tip was, a, was one of the good guys. And he, yeah. he, he did a really great job for... He did a great job as speaker too, but you know his thing about all politics is local is was true, and that's the way he lived it. But I mean, he was a he he actually liked the cartoons. He had his whole middle office that had had all the cartoons on the wall. Um, but yeah, I did like Tip. So that brings me to another question: all of the people whom you have. Uh, drawn, some of whom you have attacked, uh, ranging from the, or, or annoyed, let's say, um, ranging from the Catholic Church to the Boston, the Massachusetts State Police to, um, to the American political figures. Uh, how many of them have you ever met afterward and they said, I like this one, I didn't like this one? Uh, we have we have uh, Tip O'Neill, but uh, have you ever heard from any of the presidents, for example, that you have caricatured across the years? Well, I, actually, uh, I did get I met most of the presidents at some point, mm -hmm. but you know, despite the relationship with Tip O'Neill, um, I really always almost had a rule of that politicians were not friends. Yeah. You know, unlike a colonist or a reporter who they have to nurture a relationship. Mm -hmm. For me, for the most part, I, I didn't, I didn't hang up around the state house. I didn't, I didn't spend that much time in Washington. And if I did, it was as an observer. Um, now I did meet most of these people over the course of time and, you know, Sometimes they would ask for the originals and um, and I'd hear back. But, you know, for the most part, I really always thought of it as them and us. Yeah. Um, and it, you, you shouldn't be pals with um, a lot of these guys. Mm -hmm. I think that's the problem we have today is that you have an entire bunch of sycophants that are 
are not doing their job because they are pals with this particular guy. So you uh, worked at the Globe until 2001 and, uh, and suddenly we're in the 21st century and you leave the Boston Globe to uh, continue in other venues. And that leads me into my question about, as you, you just mentioned, the problems we have today. Uh, how do you think the business uh, is different today than it was uh, when you first got started, the newspaper business? I mean, there are, there are lots of obvious things we can talk about, but I'd rather hear you discuss what you see as the evolution of the business. Than well, um, my cartoon is basically gone. The kind of cartoon that I did is no longer because there aren't enough uh, self-sufficient newspapers in healthy condition mm -hmm. that will run these cartoons. Most papers today are so consumed with losing readers that they don't want to something that is blatantly going to offend the reader. And if you're doing the political cartoon properly, you are going to offend somebody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, that was my problem at the Globe. They, When the New York Times bought the Globe, um, I went from being a, a well-paid asset to an overpaid liability in the New York Times mind mm -hmm. because I was offending readers. And, you know, fortunately, I, I had 10 years on the Huffington Post where I could transition into uh, online. Yeah. And that, that was a good experience. But... The newspaper thing today is, um, I, I feel, you know, in reading in Thomas Nast's career, I feel like he was at the end. He, you know, the political cartoon as I did it for the Boston Globe really doesn't exist anymore. And I'll give you the, a really classic example. When Herblock died, uh, Pat Oliphant should have got that job. Pat Oliphant was by far the best cartoonist in my mind. Mm -hmm. He did hard-hitting, beautifully yeah. drawn cartoons. Pat was from Australia. Um, and they gave that job to two other people, one of whom is very talented as a caricaturist, but they they nowhere near the punch and the velocity that Pat Oliphant had. And should have had and that and he should have got that job and and, the, and even the Washington Post yeah didn't go in that direction so well when you think of your time at the Boston Globe what were you what would you say are say the three or four best political cartoons that you did what and and what was it that motivated you to do those cartoons um, uh, it's probably it's probably first of all how, how often uh, did you do a cartoon? Was it three times a week, five times a week? I remember you were in that paper an awful lot. Uh, I did it five times a week up until probably the last mm, eight years. And then I did three times a week because they brought in another guy. Yeah. And, you know, again, because uh, I think that was around the time the New York Times bought the paper and yeah. I guess they probably hoped I'd quit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you didn't. But I didn't. No. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of hard to say which cartoons were the best cartoons. I, you know, I, I've had, as you know, I've, I have had a, several compilations of, of the work. And, you know, you, you like to think that a cartoon works on a given day. It, mm -hmm. you, you nailed it or you, it was okay, but, you know, you try to nail it every day. That's, um, and I think the ones that I've shown in the, that you have there, you know, the one with the three dogs. I mean, I, I think that was a good cartoon because, it, as you say, it, it, it's done without a caption. Yeah. It's visually strong. It makes the point. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so visually strong, and, and it, um, it's almost as if you were studying um, a painting like Staggett Sharkey's uh, to ha to show the momentum of Nixon fighting the dogs. I don't know if you study if, if did you study a lot of um, a lot of art 
before you started drawing when you were younger? Um, were, you a, were you a haunter of museums, or, uh, let's no, say? As they say, I was a hockey player. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I was consumed by hockey, and it's like most Canadian kids are. I played three times a day sometimes. Uh, but, no, I, but I, what I did... I, and, and you were actually good enough to think about, uh, to think about the pros, huh? Oh, yeah, I could have done it for a living. I mean, I did it for a living as in the minors, and I could have fixed, you know, I could have gone and played it in the, um, in these different leagues, the Western League, whatever. I, I, I just knew that at that time there was only six teams in the National Hockey League, and I, I knew I wasn't going to make the Red Wings. And, yeah. you know, to play minor league hockey, mm -hmm. I, I really had no interest in that. Yeah. Um, Back to the cartoons. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, actually, the, uh, um, Domier was really more of an influence on me than anybody. Yeah. And, you know, Domier started out as a political cartoonist and spent six months in jail and had to become what I call like a New Yorker cartoonist, which is actually what I'm doing now with syndication. Uh, same sort of thing. Um, but, you know, Domier was a wonderful artist. I mean, Domier's, um, Domier's paintings were wonderful, his sculpture. Sure. And yet he had, um, you know, if he could have done the political thing a little longer, I think his political cartoons would have been very strong. Yeah. So what is your, what is your process like? This is a question people are always interested in with anybody who who creates anything. When do you work? How I'd, love you work? Hear, I'd love to hear your process sometime. As I, I find that's <laughs> got to be fascinating. Well, uh, this wall behind me, there are dents in it where I've beaten my head on it for <laughs> long periods of time. But... Um, well. Fortunately, you've 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 stayed with it because I love your stuff, Bill. Thank you. Uh, uh, the process, the process has really always been the same. Um, although you know now we have computers and and online stuff, but I always read at least three newspapers in the morning. And I still do that today. I get the New York Times delivered here in Florida every day. Uh, my wife and I read, she reads the local paper and I read the New York Times. We read in bed at five o'clock in the morning. We read our paper. It's a habit. And then I, I go up and, you know, then I look at the Washington Post online. I look at the, um, I've read the New York Times. You know, it's a case of, it's an all day process really trying to, stay juiced up so that you, know, you can produce something the next morning. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with this administration, there's something every day. So it's so you're, you're reading with the expectation of uh, coming up with something for the next day that will uh, really pop with uh, those people that look at your cartoons now online. And, uh, yes. What, yeah. What, what kind of platforms and and uh, websites carry your work now. You know, I I, I really don't follow it to be honest yeah. with you. I really don't. Uh, I know I can't do it for newspapers, and yeah. frankly, I don't really care about the online what, what's what runs sure. online. Yeah, I've got this other feature that I do. Um, you know, that's a. Well, I, I, man, my thrust right now is to is to do cartoons to dissuade people from reelecting this guy. Yes, another target-rich environment yeah. for a, for a political cartoonist, and perhaps we could see a little bit of Trump here. Uh, Sarah can put a few images up of Donald Trump. Uh, tell us about these, Paul. Can you see these? This is. Uh, uh, this I can't, Donald, yeah, you're, you're, I'm looking at a black screen. <laughs> okay, well, this is Donald Trump in the um, uh, caught in the in the gorse. 
<laughs> as a golfer. That image, oh. the, the COVID deaths behind him, and he's, um, he's just popped one out of the grass. And the other one is of Pont Pontius Pilate. Um, yeah. when you, how quickly do these images come to you? Well, you know, to be honest, uh, it's not hard right now. I mean, it's maybe it's having done them over the years and you start to think along the same lines, but it's not a struggle. It, it, it just, this guy is so blatantly corrupt and uh, dishonest that it's just kind so of, it's essentially, not my... essentially you you agree with uh, what what Trump says to the new the rest of the news media like CNN and uh, and the late night comics they're all going to miss him when he's gone. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, as I say, I'm I'm winding down my career, so yeah, uh, you know, I'm going to move on to. A different type of cartoon and more, I'm gonna as I say do these co social cartoons and and actually I'm gonna expand my portraits that's yeah. but the day my days as an editorial cartoonist to do the cartoon the way I did it initially at the Boston Globe yeah those days will be over the day Trump's out of office mm -hmm. because because no Newspapers are are fading faster than somebody's hair color. I mean, it's um, <laughs> it just, that's just the way it is. And I think you know, online. If if I had young kids coming to me today, yeah. to my office the way they did before, mm -hmm. I would tell them if you want to do political cartoons, you've got to do them. You've got to make a move. They, they, they've got to be animated because that's the future. Unfortunately, the future isn't on paper. Yeah. And do, do you literally mean make the move as if they, as if you could make the move on a, on an online kind of source? Like a, yeah, like a, actually the, 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 one of the cartoonists at the Washington Post and tennis. Yeah. She, she was an animator for Disney and, she animates her her images, mm -hmm. and she's really good. Wow. But you know, uh, that's that's viable for for kids. Yeah. But newspaper doing what I did for newspapers, because magazines don't really buy that stuff anymore either. No. So so you would say basically to most young people that would want to be political cartoonists, uh, keep your day job. <laughs> well, yeah, they do. I mean, the, the kind of cartoons you see being reprinted today are, I mean, first of all, yeah. they don't really utilize caricature. Mm -hmm. uh, they represent things. Even their Trumps are pretty symbolic rather than good caricatures. Yeah. And they're, you know, they're light, um, I don't know. I, 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 it's not the kind of. It's not the way I envision the job. But so you know, they have, images, to, they have to stay afloat. So I, you know, I, I can't complain. But these these images of Donald Trump are in color and use the color rather well, uh, which is uh, a gift to you, I guess, from the fact that you're now online rather than in in a newspaper uh as an artist when you decided to start working in color did you find it liberating inspiring is it uh what are your thoughts about about that um it's a whole lot easier mm -hmm. uh time wise i spent less time i could spend more time on the concept um you know Newspapers, it's well, actually, newspapers today are, are running color too. I mean, I have done stuff for newspapers in color, yeah, but um, it's more expensive and it's not, <clears throat> they don't run it every day for the most part. Mm -hmm. I don't even think Globe does it run it, I think they hardly ever run the stuff in color, yeah, um, yeah. A lot of the um, a lot of the great old Hollywood 
directors and cinematographers would agree with you that uh, in some ways color was uh, made, made life easier for them than working in black and white and having to conceive in shadow and, and light like that. Um, yeah, no, it, it really is easier. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I studied as an illustrator. <clears throat> so, and, and as I say, I was influenced by people like Daumier and uh, Tennell and people like that that were, you know, put some emphasis on draftsmanship. Mm-hmm. Uh, so doing the illustration in color it was never a, I, I never found that a hard adjustment. Yeah. When I went to the Huffington Post, I could do them in color, and mm-hmm. in many ways it was liberating because I could spend more time on the concept. Yeah. Now we now we're looking at a couple of your uh, golf images, the uh, the golfer going out checking the weather, the. Um, uh, that was good for your benefit. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. For those for those of you listening online, Paul and I, uh, Paul and I have played golf on occasion together. He tells me I'm very handsy. I'm not sure what that means, but um, I, actually, I am. I figured that one out. And the other <laughs> images of the golf the golf club club flying over the wall of the Utopia Golf Club. When you do one of these cartoons, you're just um, um, you're, you're doing something totally different from the Paul Zepp of, uh, uh, of the Boston Globe. Um, yes, they're, they're, they're in a feature that I do called Today's Zepp, and it's, it's syndicated by... Um, Go Comics. It's called Go Comics, yes, oh. and it's, um, it's syndicated, and I, I do three of those a week. Mm-hmm. And they are, they're... I like to think of them as they're like New Yorker cartoons, but hopefully yeah. better drawn and in color. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're always better drawn, Paul. They're always uh, there's always a, a real sense of depth and of uh, of life to these images, and that I think is what has always made your um, uh, your work so so unique. Um, not only the political observations, but also the uh, the art itself. And I see about 14 questions popping up on the Q&A here. And I'm thinking that perhaps we should throw this to the audience and to, to Gavin, who has some questions to read. Yeah, we have uh, some good ones. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Ed asked, uh, which cartoons earned you the Pulitzer Prize? Uh, well, one of them was on Watergate, and the other one was, the other series was uh, <laughs> Congressional Corruption, which could have been any year. <laughs> <laughs> and then I won a third time, but they took it away because they thought it was too many. So. All right. Um, so EJ asked, uh, when you first started, how did your cartoon become something that could be printed? Did you have to give your original to your editor? And how did the image get distributed by the syndicate in the pre-internet age? Was your studio at the newspaper's office? So I think there's a couple questions in there. But. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, actually, I, yes, I had an office at the Globe. And I would, um, I would turn them into the editorial page editor and they would send them to engraving downstairs sometimes if i needed something special i would go down to the engraving department myself i had a really nice relationship with these guys and um yeah and they would you know they went from there was a time when the the, it was all done with metal on the plates and and then they went to offset like everybody else but um and as far as the syndicate, uh, they, they, you know, they were just mailed out. So you had to have a certain lead time. It's a, a different era, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so a uh, anonymous attendee asked, um, I have been struck in looking at the personal papers of public figures. Uh, how many 
uh, have caricatures, even very savage satires, of themselves in their papers. Do you know anyone whom you satirized who kept your cartoons of them? Obviously, oh, O'Neill, but. I, the, yeah, they did. A lot, actually, a lot of these guys would ask for the originals. And, you know, at the time at the Globe, I, I would oblige them. Um, I'm not sure I would oblige any of these guys today. On the has, Trump, has Trump asked for it? <laughs> and to be honest with you, I would never play golf with Trump. So oh. I have some standards. Yes. Well, strict rules of golf would, would be observed if we were playing with Paul Zepp. <laughs> Which isn't what he does from what we hear. You have another question, Gavin? Sure. Uh, Christopher said, uh, I grew up in Boston in the 70s learning about politics and drawing from your cartoons, Nixon slash Watergate, etc. You got me very excited to draw. Thank you. You mentioned um, Dowemeyer. Uh, do you also paint? Well, yes, I paint. Uh, I do portraits. Hmm. Uh, I've got, in fact, I've got a whole book of, of the portraits. They're I call them iconic portraits, and they're, they, there's a range, sports, entertainment, politics, former presidents, bad guys, bad guys <laughs> um, movie people, somebody who I think has an interesting face, uh, or who, who's somebody who I, I, I admire. I just, I just did Antonin Dvorak yesterday, because I just love Antonin, you know, I love Dvorak. Um, so that's, yeah, I do those to sort of maintain my sanity in these days. Uh, the, view, the viewers can see two of them on the walls behind you there, uh, Thomas Nast. And, and who's that president? Uh, is that a president? Is that Millard Fillmore? No, that's Honor Domier. Oh, that's Domier. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I will look like Millard Fillmore. <laughs> yeah. I've done Miller Fillmore too. So <laughs> you also have Paul Zepp, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Thomas Nast uh, behind you, which uh, we're featuring in our uh, online exhibit of Thomas yeah. Nast. So um, people can see the original, uh, <laughs> or they can visit our our online <laughs> exhibition and see a reproduction. And they and they pop online. They really have a a, a great look to them online. Um, Paul said, which Massachusetts governor did you most like to draw? Well, I had two favorites. Uh, when I first came to Boston, John Volpe was the governor. And he, I could just do him so easily. And I would, uh, for some reason, he got tied in with this analogy of, of using or olive oil. So I would always put him with a bottle of olive oil which used to drive him crazy, I guess. And the other guy was Ed King. And uh, Ed King, I think, actually sued the Globe. But um, he was easy to draw. So and he, was he sued you for <laughs> libel, didn't he? He did, yes. That's yeah. true. <laughs> what what yeah. did you do to make him sue you for libel? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I can't remember now, but <laughs> you always used to draw him with uh, a clown hat and a clown nose, I believe. Yes, that's it. Yeah. And you were pretty relentless about that. Yeah. Can do. That's what his thing was. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and um, he's, he would be the kind of guy who would be uh, very, I think, very touchy, frustrated by uh, by that yeah. sort of thing, and that never, was, never asked for an original. <laughs> no, no. Can you imagine Trump? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Another one you have in there. Elaine uh, said, "Hi, Paul. You did a wonderful interview for the video program I did on uh, cartoons about Hillary Clinton as first lady. I'm watching what's going on with cartoons about Kamala Harris." Um, are you doing any about her? No, I've been really so concentrating on the Trump stuff. Um, and I'm hoping I'll be doing her as a vice president next year in a, in a, in a less aggressive way, certainly. 
<laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> so um, let's see if we have a couple more. Um, uh, Bill asked, uh, and this is, I guess, a, a pretty theoretical question, but he said, are most political cartoonists pessimists or cynics? <laughs> which doesn't give you the option of being an optimist, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, the, my little gang of cartoonists is quite small. So I, um, I think most of them, my friends in the business, we all kind of think along the same lines, I think, or operate the same way. That's probably why we're friends. But, you know, cartoonists, um, well, there's a difference between political cartoonists and comic strip cartoonists and gag cartoonists. They're all, they're all cut from different cloths. Well, what are you? Are you an optimist, pessimist, cynic, all, all of the above? What would you I say? I, I think I'm very cynical these days about mm -hmm. the way that, you know, when you do this stuff eight hours a day, you, you probably do know more about how the system works than the average bear. Yeah. And that that does produce cynicism. Yeah. So you 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 put in a full eight hour day. Well, I, I, I'm doing this all the time. Yeah. I mean, I, I go hit balls and I go play nine holes, and but right. then I, you know, my wife will tell you that this is yeah. all consuming. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't think real work. <laughs> I don't think I ever said that. Uh, seeing how the sausage is made makes you <laughs> um, uh, more enjoy the sausage. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we had a question that said, um, if you think being from Canada gives you a different perspective on American politics, having grown up sort of in a slightly different system. Oh yeah. I think being from Canada was, uh, I came in as more as, as an observer, which was good. You know, I, w I didn't have built-in biases from growing up. I think it, it really did help. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, I think I was much more objective. I, I never saw myself um, as, a, as an ideologue of any sort. You know, I, I would go after what I saw was not working or somebody who was being corrupt or, abusing the job and it didn't matter whether they were a democrat or a liberal or a conservative or whatever uh, yeah i think it was a great help paul the, the boston that you came to from canada in the mid 60s was a pretty uh tribal place and uh here you came this outsider uh to start commenting upon it first of all what did you think of the city when you got here? Had you been here before? And um, how, did, uh, how did people outside of the globe react initially when they found out that here was this Canadian guy uh, come, to, come to tell us what we were doing right and wrong? Well, uh, you know, the globe was one of the first papers to come out against the war. Yeah. And so I did a lot of anti-war stuff in the beginning, too. Mm -hmm. And that, that wasn't well received by a lot of people. I would get toilet paper in the mail, as I said. Yeah. Um, but I think people, you know, I didn't get a lot of, people knew I was a hockey player, too. So yeah. So that, that puts you in good stead with a lot of people. Right? Yeah. Um, but I think over the course of time, you know, I've been blackballed at five golf clubs and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it hasn't been exactly <laughs> a entirely paved road. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that, that we did receive a number of uh, comments. I'm just going to read one or two of them. But um, Bob wrote, uh, when I was a an aspiring political cartoonist at BU in the early 1970s. You let me visit you at the Globe uh, and were very encouraging. Just wanted to say thanks after all these years. So, oh, that's nice, I appreciate that. Some people may remember you from long ago, but um, following up on Bill's uh, last comment, you know, Boston, um, Boston in the 60s, 70s and 80s was really a city that was largely in decline. Um, and people who are living in Boston today live in this city that is this economic juggernaut. 
Um, and I think that's just sort of interesting, you know, what are your thoughts on how the city changed? I mean, Boston in 1985 versus Boston in 2015 uh, is just, you know, light years away from each other. Um, in 85, its population was declining. Uh, it had no biotechnology. There was no high-tech industry. Uh, it looked sort of economically adrift. So I don't, do you have any thoughts on how the city changed in the years that you were covering it? N not really. I mean, I, you know, when I first came here, I lived in the suburbs. And then I, uh, I'm, I lived in Brookline for, the, for most of my time here in Boston. Um, I don't really think that, I, I, I don't know, it wasn't something that I really dealt with much. You know, it, frankly, you know, when you're, when you're immersed in something, you don't really, I see it now. I mean, that's why I don't, I have a hard time going back there because it's so bloody crowded. I mean, the, the traffic is terrible. Um, I see a major change now in terms of traffic and it's become unaffordable. I mean, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty easy to, to live where I was living. Let me put it that way. And I lived very comfortably in Brookline and had access to Boston. If I wanted to go into Boston, that was the thing that was always great about it was the access. But yeah, I think it is a different place today, and you know that's why I guess we live in Sarasota. Oh. Yeah. Well, we have uh, another comment which uh, Bettina said. I have a lithograph of your national security blanket, and I wish I had many more. Um, okay. I was devastated when you left the globe. I'm also pleased with your uh, comments about the globe in those days. Yes, it was a great paper then, and the tailors. Whoops. Uh, and the tailors. Uh, this is cut off. Whoops. Sorry about that. Uh, and the tailors were marvel marvelous people. My husband manages their manage their finances, so we were particularly fond of them. Your technique also reminds me of uh, Leonard Baskin, sharp, edgy. And yes, I love Tip O'Neill too. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, that's nice. I appreciate that. That's really nice. And that that's a good description of the technique. There is a and and not just edgy in terms of the ideas, but just in terms of the, the visuals themselves. Uh, that sharp edginess is, is something that, that I think sets, sets your work apart from, from that of most political cartoonists that I've studied across the years. And well, that's praise from Caesar. I appreciate that. Uh, do you have a specific non-cartoon artist that you really appreciate the work of or that you're really interested in? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I guess, uh, yeah, I, have, uh, you know, I can't go through a whole litany of them right now, but yeah, I really do appreciate good art. There's... Um, Yeah. <laughs> I don't, uh, Who's your favorite novelist, Paul? <laughs> well, my favorite is, is a guy named William Martin. <clears throat> I just thought I'd throw that in in order to <laughs> get, stimulate your mind a little bit. Yeah. But if you had, if if you had to draw one president, uh, and knew you knew you had. Uh, the opportunity for the rest of your life to work on one guy politically, who would it be? Somebody you would either admire or somebody that you just say, oh man, I want to draw another one about, about this guy. Uh, let me, I mean, besides Nixon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think probably uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Hmm. That would be an interesting. I mean, a very complex guy and um, yeah. Jim, um, good and bad. Yeah, yeah. Have have you have you done one of those portraits of TR like the? Uh, of the yeah, I have. Thomas, Thomas Past. Yeah, uh, probably. I don't know whether you, you. I could show it to you actually. Sure. 
should be downstairs there. Um, While we're waiting on that, I think we have uh, time for one or two more questions. Um, but Kim asked, uh, and Kim um, started with a, had a, uh, <laughs> a little addendum to this, but she said, looking at most political cartoonists, which I love, it seems like most are on the liberal side. Are there any, are there any good conservative ones? And then she said, I am a liberal. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Jeff McNally used to be a, was one of the great cartoonists, political cartoonists, and unfortunately Jeff died way too soon. But he was a very conservative guy and, and you know, his cartoons were conservative. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of a, um, when you think about it, to be a conservative, it, it sort of goes against the whole principle of, of satire. I mean, it's hard. Um, I find that incongruous, really. Um, but yeah, Jeff would be, I mean, I knew Jeff. I loved Jeff. He was a, he was such a talented guy, but he's the only one I can think of that had any real talent. And it, it, yeah, I think it is, you know, uh, you're talking about being progressive. Well, you're trying to get change. You're trying to r remove inequities. Uh, you criticize people who are being abusive. Uh, I don't know how you can do that as a, somebody trying to maintain the status quo. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it seems a contradiction in terms. Anyway, this is. Uh, you might need to back up. A I know, you can see this. This is yeah. this is Teddy. There he is. You see that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That looks. Uh, uh, the mustache is gray. That's after he was president. Perhaps uh, when he was r running for the Bull Moose Party, perhaps. Yeah. Anyway, he, I think he'd be an interesting guy. Yeah, that's great. So I think we uh, just have one last question, which was um, a person asked if you had drew any uh, comics of Bobby Orr combined here, yeah. hockey and, uh, and comics. I knew Bobby Orr. I played golf with Bobby. He was one of my sponsors at a golf club. I love Bobby. He was, he, and you know, Bobby Orr was, Bobby Orr was as great off the ice as he was on the ice. He was that kind of person. He is that kind of person. Um, but yeah, I have a, um, I don't know whether I have it here. Well, yeah, there it is up. I don't know whether you can see it. I have, there's an image of Bobby Orr and Ray Bork, another guy I, I played golf with. I don't know whether you can see that up there. Can you? Can you? I get my oh, oh, look at that. There you go. You got him up there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we can't see what you see. <laughs> yeah. We got We saw it. It's good. We saw it. Okay. Well, uh, okay. I want to be of everyone getting ready to, to make dinner. Uh, but uh, I wanted to thank you uh, for sharing. Uh, with us. I think it was a great program. And uh, Bill, thank you for doing a, a wonderful job uh, moderating. Um, My pleasure. Well, thank you for having me. And Bill, thank you for doing me. And I, I uh, yeah, if I just, you are the best. I love your stuff. And I well, can't wait for your next opus. I, I want you to work on my golf swing the next time uh, we're together. Single plane. That's what we're working on right now. Single I want plane. you to explain to me what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I see another public program in the making. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, gentlemen. Okay. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.